I'm a leader. Nada. Follow. Show it to me. Tomorrow I'm back and I'm going to. I'm a leader. Nada. Follow. Show it to me. Tomorrow I'm back and I'm going to And I like it like that. And I'll never stop. Ba la 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 la. Chloe, your turn. It's okay to be. 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 Different. It's okay to be. And make today magical. And if anybody tries to ruin your magic, I'm good. And don't. Father Carl. You're not a speck of dust. You're probably good. It's okay to laugh. I taught both my children how to ride a bike, but I myself never learned how to ride. <laughs> I couldn't get on the bike and teach them the mechanics of pedaling and finding your rhythm and balance. I couldn't do that. All I could do is be there to catch them whenever they fell off. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself and me never would just want to get back on it. And that's why I never learned. But when my children fell, I was always there to pick them up and put them back on and say, do it again. They fell again, pick them up, put them back on and do it again. Now they ride their bikes through the neighborhood and people ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike and you didn't? And I tell them, I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves and all I had to do was be there. Sometimes you don't have to know everything about being a dad. You just gotta be there. Danny's too. She's the wildest baby I've ever seen. Sam, he's all heart. Josie, I can say, hey, we're, we're just gonna go to the store and, and grab some milk. Why? It's such a validating feeling for your seven-year-old son to call you his best bud. I, I used to wish my first child was a boy, but having a girl, you learn so much from a girl. My baby, she, <laughs> she's my life. <laughs> I remember when I got the news of the birth of my first daughter. And the first emotion that I had was, I was scared to death. Right. I couldn't get over the fear of people believing that I could not be a father. As a dad, you don't want to make mistakes, right? And so that confidence came to me over time. You know, I think it's interesting that one of the biggest misconceptions about fathers is that when they don't take an active role in their children's lives, that they're being willful and intentional about doing it. What I found in my work with dads is that if and when that's the case, oftentimes there are many barriers and obstacles that they end up facing. There's a cycle that happens to dads and it starts with getting separated from their kids. And that can happen for a lot of different reasons. Maybe the mom is keeping him away or maybe he's incarcerated. Maybe he suffers from some kind of addiction. But the longer that separation goes on, the harder and harder it gets for him to come back because the cycle of that shame continues to build and build and build. My biggest fear in the middle of my addiction was that I would never be able to get over it and that my kids wouldn't have a father. I overdosed on heroin and I lived. And I started thinking, you know what? This isn't my story. I, I missed so much with my first child you know, because of addiction and the situation with this mother, it, it doesn't get easier to stay away, but it really feels like it gets harder to come back because you know there's gonna be questions. You know, why weren't you there? What was going on? And really in those moments, no answer is gonna be good enough. I get a little emotional, man, because like I said, it's. It's a guilt that I kind of live with every day. You know, why do these kids have you all the time, Dad, and, and I don't? You know what I mean? So it's just talking about is kind of bringing it, you know, to the surface. I didn't meet my father until I was 23 years old. And when I met him, I was young. I had a two-year-old daughter in my life. 
I wanted to be the father to my child that he wasn't for me. And I had gotten disconnected. And so there was this day I come down to New York and I'm saying, I'm gonna go and see my daughter. I'm gonna be daddy riding in to the rescue. And I'm standing outside and I'm excited because they're coming downstairs and they're coming towards me and I see my daughter coming out of the door and they walk towards me and they walked right past me. Mm. And I was like, yeah. Either she didn't see me or she doesn't know me. Mm -hmm. Either way, they hurt. Both of them hurt. Killed me. Yeah. I rode around Brooklyn, like trying to convince myself that I wasn't a bad person. You know, I think about there's a lot of institutional issues and challenges that suggest to us that dads aren't essential, and, and I've always rejected that. There's public policy that exists that requires dads to be disengaged in order for families to be eligible. I feel like it's such a broken system. I know men who have children and are paying child support for their children, but don't necessarily have visitation rights. There's no system there to help keep the family together. There's a lot of systems in place to pull money from dad's pocket, but not necessarily put dad back in the house. You know, I'm a social worker by trade, and I'll never forget working with kids in foster care when we would have to file termination of parental rights petitions. When a kid was in foster care for 15 out of 22 months, the social workers would have to file the termination petition to sever those parents' legal rights so that the child would be free to be adopted. And oftentimes, dads would never even know. So what happened was I found myself just doing my job and following policy, I was complicit in a system of oppression. Hi, I'm Tina Naidu. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're in a very unique place because what we have not talked about today is fathers who have incarcerated backgrounds. The idea is that when you go to prison, there's rehabilitation. Oftentimes, the correctional institutions don't offer that, but many of our male clients or fathers are working on that when they're behind walls. They're writing letters, they're sitting through uh, therapy in groups, and they're hoping that when they get home, they can have a, a real conversation with their children, with their family, and they can be accepted back. A lot of times the judges will say, unless you have a healthy, safe living environment, we can't release the children back to you. The problem with that is nobody rents to them. Nobody will give them a job because of their background. So how do you create a healthy, stable living environment and how do you get your children back? So we tend to spend a lot of time motivating our client to stay in the game, to keep fighting, not to give up. I was in prison and her mom had a heart attack. I told myself I could raise my child myself. I could do everything myself. I'm going to take custody of my daughter. We left the prison at 6 o'clock. I was in court by 9. And this lady walked in. She got on this long robe or whatever. And I told her the situation. She said, I don't know why no one would want to take no one's daughter when the mother is deceased. You're seeking for another chance in the world, and I'm going to give it to you. I made a lot of promises to myself I had to keep. And I came home to live for my purpose. And so far, since I've been home from prison, it's like walking into heaven. I got custody of my daughter. That's a beautiful picture, man. 
That's a beautiful picture. Ain't nothing like being a father in this world. When they learn something new and it just clicks in their brain, I just realized I could do this. And you can just see in their faces. It's, it's such an incredible moment. It's those moments that are, that are my favorite. There was a certain point in time where I didn't, I just wasn't taking care of myself. I came down with some crippling depression, anxiety, exhaustion, and that depression ended up rolling downhill. My wife was critically depressed and it emptied into my daughter to where, you know, she was getting made fun of at school. And at the time, because I'm not mentally in the space that I need to be in, I'm coming down on her hard for stuff that's really not her fault. I was the one with the problem. I wasn't taking care of myself properly. And it caused, it caused a number of critical issues. And the moment I finally just humbled myself and buckled down and went to the hospital, and it taught me, it's not about me. It's really not. Because whatever happens to me and affects me mentally and physically, it's gonna roll downhill and my children are a part of that hill. The conversation that we're having today, even though it's about fatherhood, it's really about children. Everything that we do is about the well-being of children. I think that's really important. This is not a fight. This is not a contest where someone wins and somebody loses, except your children. I think the biggest misconception is that we're absent. My question is, where are you looking? Because everywhere I go, I see dads. You know, when I go to school, I see them. When I see them dropping off their kids in the morning, I see them. When I go to my kids' game, I see them. When I'm at the supermarket, I see them. They're all over the place. How are you missing us? So the question is, where do we go, right? Where do we go for help? Um, who do we ask um, when we're feeling vulnerable? The go-to has always been you go to your own father or you go to someone who serves as your father for information. You go to that model, right? But one of the things that I think that our dads need is affirmation. You're absolutely right because uh, fatherhood needs validation, you know? Because we are internally, we're thinking, am I doing the right thing? Am I qu always questioning, am I being a good parent? Women have been, certainly are more notoriously uh, connectors with each other. But men are not that good at it, is my uh, perception. How do we help men in those natural resource spaces where they feel comfortable about asking for something that their manhood may or may not make them feel comfortable in asking for. As a dad, as a male, you know, sometimes you, f you feel alone and you, you're looking for, sometimes I feel like you want to challenge yourself not just for you, but for your children too. I'm a father of two, uh, my husband, but, you know, I'm learning, you know, every day. I believe that everybody on some level understands that fathers matter. If we can get past the emotion of how we've been hurt by a dad or by a man in our life who serves as a dad, I think we can find a way um, to create a bridge um, back to the hearts of our fathers.